so uh, we will continue. Um, so today I'm covering some new stuff from chapter 7. It's kind of a, I guess, an introduction to the topic of hypothesis testing. Um, just kind of give us a, maybe some background and things like that. Um, but I'm not assigning any uh, homework problems today. Uh, next week, lab two is due. Okay, so uh, so that 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 assignment exists. So that will be collected next week. Um, I'll get the uh, midterm exams graded sometime this week, and I'll send you a grade report uh, via email with uh, your exam and quiz and homework scores. else I need to say. I think that's about it. So, okay, well, um, I don't uh, pass back the uh, the exams. So if you, uh, so once I have the exams graded, if you want to take a look at it, you'll have to come see me during office hours. So just come to class early and you can take a look at your exam. Uh, but I, look, I don't let the uh, students keep the, uh, keep the tests. Okay. We'll uh, get into chapter seven. Hypothesis tests. So, hypothesis tests is a continuation of inference, but we're taking. Um, doing inference from another perspective. So, uh, in chapter 6, we looked at confidence intervals. Confidence intervals, we take a sample, we look at the sample, and based on what we see about from in the sample, we try to make a statement about the population. So, if we observe a sample, and we look at the, uh, the mean of the sample. Based on the mean of the sample, we make a statement about the population. In hypothesis testing, uh, we are also looking at samples, and we're making conclusions about the population based on the sample, but we're taking it uh, from a different perspective. Okay? With confidence intervals, we really don't um, have much to say about the population to begin with, and we just look at the sample and let the sample speak for itself. With well, a hypothesis test, we have something in mind already. We have a hypothesis in mind. We say, um, I think the population looks like this, or I think the population has this mean. We have something about the, uh, the, hypo uh, about the population in mind. We take, a, uh, we take a sample to test that hypothesis. And we want, to, uh, we want to see if the data from our sample disputes or uh, goes against what was in the, uh, uh, our ideas about the population, or if it doesn't. Okay? The, uh, in that regard, the sample never actually proves that our hypothesis is true. It just goes to, um, it's just used to see if it can prove our hypothesis false. Okay. So, hypothesis test, this is uh, another form of inference. Form of inference. We have hypothesis in mind. We believe something. We believe testing to 
to see if the population has some property. Okay. So, in the context of the uh, the chapter in chapter seven, the property about the population that we make a hypothesis about is the population mean. Okay. So, in chapter seven, our hypotheses state that the population has some mean value. Okay, so we say, I believe that the mean of the population is this, or somebody is claiming that. So we believe the population has some <coughs> property. This is uh, one of our hypotheses, generally the null hypothesis. And then um, we gather data. So in chapter 7, we're going to learn uh, a specific form of the hypothesis test. Hypothesis test is kind of this general term for uh, testing hypotheses. In chapter 7, we're going to learn um, specifically the t-test okay, to compare samples uh, simply means that the samples, the collection of data for one sample has no influence on the collection of data for the other sample. Okay? The two samples something called the null hypothesis. This is our statement about the population that, uh, that we are testing. Okay. And when, uh, when we do a t-test to compare means from two independent samples, our null hypothesis says that um, the population corresponding to sample 1 has the same mean as the population corresponding to sample 2.
So sample one comes from one population. Sample two comes from another population. And the null hypothesis says that those two populations have the same mean. Okay? So if you imagine our picture of population one, population two, from population one we draw a sample, sample one, and from population two we have sample two. We can only observe the samples, we can't observe the populations directly, but the null hypothesis says that the mean, mean of population one is equal to the mean of population two. That's what the null hypothesis states. But all we can do is observe the mean of sample 1 and the mean of sample 2. So this is what we want to test. But what we observe is y1 bar and y2 bar. And these are our uh, random samples. So it's very unlikely for the two sample means to be exactly equal. Even if you drew two samples from this exact same population, okay, I'm unlikely to get two samples that are going to produce the exact same sample mean. Right? So the null hypothesis states that the two populations have the same mean, but all we can observe are the sample means. And based on what we see with the sample means, we want to know, does that disprove the null hypothesis? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, when we observe our sample means, if our sample means are similar, what do you think we would conclude? Doesn't disprove it. Yeah. If the sample means are very close to each other, our conclusion will probably be we have no evidence to believe that the null hypothesis is wrong. Okay. Notice it does not prove that the null hypothesis is true. Okay. Because all we're doing is we're taking random samples. And even if our random samples, our two uh, samples, happen to have the exact same sample mean, which is highly unlikely to happen anyway. But even if that were to happen, it's just a random sample from the populations. So that doesn't prove that the populations have the same mean either. Okay? Because the only way we could see if the populations actually have the same mean is to observe the populations directly, which we cannot do. So we cannot actually prove that the populations have the same but, um, but if the sample means that we observe are wildly different, if y1 bar is extremely large in value and y, y bar 2 is extremely small in value, that would give us reason to believe that the null hypothesis is wrong. Okay. So we have the null hypothesis, and for a t-test, it's in the form um, mu1 equals mu2. <coughs> and so if the null hypothesis is not true, then that means the alternative hypothesis must be true. The alternative hypothesis will be um, the two populations do not have the same mean. Um, the alternative hypothesis we write 
shorthand, we write HA. And the null hypothesis, the shorthand, HO or H0. So, in short, the null hypothesis would be mu1 is equal to mu2. The alternative, mu1 does not equal mu2. Alternative form, uh, this can be also be written Two means are the same, and this over here says there is no difference between the two means. They're still <coughs> stating the same thing, but you might see them written in, uh, in either form, and they're, they're stating the same. So how does a hypothesis test work? Okay. Well, we're going to go through a bunch of math in calculating something called a p-value. Okay. So when we run a hypothesis test, we try to calculate something called a p-value. And a p-value, this is a, a term we're going to hear many times, and it's it's important that we learn what a p-value, uh, what it is, what it means, how to use one properly. Okay? The p-value is a probability, but it's not something you're accustomed to. Okay? The p-value is the probability of observing data like our samples or something more extreme. So let me just write this, okay? The p-value is the probability of observing data like our sample, like our, uh, like our samples, or something more extreme. If we assumed that the null hypothesis is true. So I'm going to um, step aside from the t-test. Okay, the t-test we're looking at the means of two populations. Okay, but to explore this concept of the p-value, didn't mean to cross that out. Uh, to explore this concept of the p-value, we're going to, I guess, take a slight side step, and, uh, and we'll go to. Uh, <coughs> Pretend to be in a casino. Okay, so at a casino, let's say we'll play a roulette. Okay. Game of pure chance. I don't know how to spell roulette. Okay. But roulette looks like this. And uh, 
it's the one with the wheel, all right? So if you don't know a roulette, it's the one with the wheel, it spins around, and then they throw a marble, or a little ball, and it goes around, and then it lands in one of the spots, and there's uh, 38 spots, okay? Number 1 through 36, and then there's a, a O and a double O, all right? And you basically bet on any one of the numbers, or you can bet on red or black, okay? There's 38 spots, uh, 18 are red, 18 are black, 2 are green, okay? And if you, uh, if you bet on red and it hits red, you, uh, you get your um, bet back plus even money, okay? So if you bet $10 on red and the ball lands in red, you will get uh, your original $10 back plus the casino will give you $10, so you take 20 I guess. Is that okay? All right, so anyway, the probability, if, if we're bidding on red, the probability of hitting red would be 18 out of 38, which is like 47% or 47.5%, something like that. Let's see. 0. 0.474, we'll just round it off to 0. 0.474. 0. 474. series of Oceans uh, 11, 12, and 13. And in Oceans 13, it was completely ridiculous, but they supposedly rigged all of these games so everybody would be winning a ton of money and stuff like that. I don't think it's actually possible to really uh, successfully rig casino games and stuff, but people always try. And let's just say it is possible, okay? And so the uh, the casino managers or the pit bosses there out to uh, to make sure no one is cheating. Okay, so let's say um, let's say I go to Vegas and I decide to play roulette and I base uh, I decide to play on the uh, the old strategy of just betting red. Okay, not a very good one. You'll lose your money quickly. But let's say I I do this. Okay, so let's say I play. Um, 10 games of roulette. Okay. Now let's say I win 6 of them. I win 6 times. And all I'm doing is betting red. So uh, the manager comes up and he says, uh, I think you are cheating. So someone comes up and accuses me of cheating. So I say, what? How dare you? Okay. And he says, uh, well, the probability of winning by betting on red only is 0.474. You won't play 10 games, so we are expecting you to win 4.74 games. Because uh, I took statistics and uh, I know that much about the binomial distribution. So your mean number of winnings should be 4.74 games, and you won 6 games. That is more than uh, what should happen by. Uh, that's more than the mean, so I think you are cheating. Okay? What would my response be? Huh? You're wrong. Okay, I'd say no, I'm not cheating, of course not. But how could I defend myself successfully? I would just say, no, I'm just lucky, right? I just got lucky. I got lucky. I won six games. It's not that big of a deal. A lot of people probably win six games if they play the game ten times. Does that sound like reasonable defense? Yeah, it sounds reasonable, okay? And, uh, and we could... Uh... So my 
response, my defense, I am just lucky. <coughs> okay? And so I could say, look, if you're going to, if you want me to show you how lucky I am, or just so that, uh, that it's not that unusual, I could say, all right. If, if someone else were to play 10 games of roulette, and let's say they're playing fair, how many of them would win 6 times out of 10? Can we figure that probability out? Yeah, what would we do? We would do 10 to 6 times 0.474 to the 6 times 1 minus 0.474 to the 4th, right? So this is somebody who's playing 10 games. This is the probability of them winning 6 games. Is that okay? And then, I'm going to say, if you're accusing me of cheating by winning 6 games, then surely you must accuse somebody if they won 7 games. And you would accuse anybody who wins 8 games, 9 games, or 10 games, right? So, how often would somebody be accused of cheating if they, when they play 10 games? So, they would accuse them of cheating if they won 7, 8, 9, or 10 games. So, we could calculate all of these out. I could just do what? 1 minus p binome 5, 0.47410, or 5, what is it, 5, 10, 0.474, something like that. Does that sound reasonable? Using uh, r, mm -hmm. p binome. I just want to make sure this is okay, right? Is this not okay? I could do d binome 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. It would be equal. 6 through 10. And throw that in sum. Okay, so I'll do that. Okay, and so the answer comes out to be 0.314125. Somebody is going to, um, if they're going to start accusing someone of cheating if they win six or more games, how often will somebody be accused of cheating? Or this is just the probability of winning six or more games out of ten, even if they were playing purely fairly. Okay? So if someone, so let's see, 0.314125, this is uh, the probability. Winning six or more games out of ten, uh, or anyone playing fairly. Okay. So if the casino manager 
is accusing me of cheating because I won six games out of ten. And if he's going to follow that rule for accusing anyone of cheating, then that means he would be accusing how many people? About 31% of people, or he would be accusing people about 31% of the time, even if they're playing the game fairly. Okay? That sounds like a lot of people to be accusing of cheating. So, because of that, 30% of people will win 6 games out of 10, just on 6 games out of 10 or more, um, based purely on luck or pure chance, it would seem like it's not a good idea to accuse someone of cheating if they just won 6 games out of 10. Does that sound fair? Okay. So this probability is high, so we would not want to um, reject the notion or the possibility that I am playing fairly. Okay? I'm just lucky and I say about 31% of people will win 6 games out of 10. will win 6 games out of 10 from random chance alone. So, um, so 31% is high. So we should not dismiss the possibility cheating, and I had only won 6 out of 10, that was 60% of the games, and we found, we decided it wasn't that big of a deal. And, uh, and still, I'm only winning 60% of my games, 60 out of 100 this time. It's not that big of a deal, okay? But he says, well, I took statistics, I went online, I learned, taught myself statistics in this meantime, so now I know, this is how I know you're cheating, okay? And he goes, alright. Let's say you were playing fair. Then let's figure the probability that somebody playing fair would win the game 60 times. And just like you said, if 
I'm going to accuse you of cheating six, for winning 60 times, I would also accuse anybody if they went more than 60 times out of 100. So, so we can figure out, you know, what is the probability of someone winning Sixty games or more. Sixty games or more <coughs> out of one hundred. Out of one hundred games, uh, if they are playing fairly. Okay. So. If I want to calculate this, what would I do? Uh, one minus P. Yeah, it would be 1 minus P by now. What do you think this answer is? Huh? Pretty small, right? It's 0 0.0075. Sixty games or more out of a hundred is point zero zero seven five. And it says that seems pretty small. It says so at this point he has a there's a two things he could believe. He can believe that I am one of the 0 0.0075 and I'm just really, really lucky and I happen to win 60 games out of 100. Or, you could say, he's probably not this lucky and is in fact cheating. What, do you, what would he say? Cheating. cheating. So the answer is we don't know, okay? But he's but our, uh, our casino manager, he doesn't like me. So he says, uh, he says, it is possible, I suppose it is possible that you were just really lucky and you won this many games just from random chance alone. But you would have to be this lucky, okay? For someone to be this lucky, it is only, it's only 0 0.0075, so less than 1%. Three, about three-fourths of 1% will be that lucky. He's, he says, you know, I'm willing to disregard that possibility because it's so small. I'm willing to ignore that possibility and conclude that you are cheating. Okay? So this probability, the probability Point zero zero seven five is small enough uh, that that the casino manager uh, will quote unquote ignore it. that I'm cheating and sends me away, alright? 
Is that okay? So, is it, but is it possible that he's wrong and that I was just happened to be this lucky? Yeah. Yeah, it is possible. Okay, it is possible that I am one of the 0 0.0075. I am less one of the less than one percent that are this lucky. But he's going to say, you know, I'm going to take that risk and just conclude that you are cheating, and so I'm going to send you away. Um, and, uh, well, I don't think he's going to break my legs, but I guess he could. But then, <laughs> but you'd probably want, your, well, you'd want that um, risk to be a uh, possibility that I'm cheating to be, um, playing fairly to be even, even smaller. <coughs> Risk a lawsuit if I were to or something. I don't know. Okay. So the idea here, okay, these these values that we calculated, these are both p values. Okay. It's the probability of observing our data for something more extreme if the null hypothesis were true. I never explicitly stated the null hypothesis, but what was the null hypothesis? The null hypothesis is the thing that we assume to be true when we're doing our calculations. What were we assuming to be true when we were doing these calculations of probability? That you were playing fairly? That I was playing fairly. So, although it was not stated here, the null hypothesis was that uh, I am playing fairly. Okay, so that means the probability of Winning on red is 18 out of 38. We, have, we assumed this thing to be true when we did our calculations. Okay. When we did the calculations for what's the probability of winning 6 out of 10 set or more, 6 or more out of 10, we assumed the probability of winning was 18 out of 38. When we did this calculation of what's the probability of 60 out of a, <coughs> winning 60 or more out of 100, we assumed that the probability of winning was 18 out of 38. Under that assumption, we can calculate the probability of observing our data, which was winning 60 games out of 100, or something more extreme. Okay, So the p-value is the probability of observing data like our samples, or something more extreme if we assume that the null hypothesis is true. That more extreme comes with the 60 games or more. Okay. So we're not asking what's the probability of winning exactly 60 games out of 100. We're saying if 60 games out of 100 is raising a flag, then 61 or anything higher would also raise a red flag. So the probability of winning 60 games or more, that's the probability of observing your sample or something more extreme if we assume the null hypothesis was true, if we assume the probability of winning was 18 out of 30. <coughs> okay. So we got p values. Okay, and that, that, that is what we use here. And so what we saw was that when the p value is small, we have reason to believe that the null hypothesis is wrong. P value here is 0 0.0075. So, is it possible that I'm playing fair and I want this? Yes, it's possible, but it's unlikely. And because it's so unlikely, we have reason to believe that the null hypothesis is false. So, when the p value is small, Of them. <coughs> the p 
p-value is large, uh, we aren't ready to reject the null hypothesis. Okay. We do not reject the null hypothesis. We cannot dismiss the possibility by random chance alone. 